My mind's distracted and diffused With thoughts are many miles away They lie with you when you are Hey, welcome back to Guitar Discoveries. This is a book. Uh, it's, it happens to be on my iPad, that's why it looks funny, but it's a book by Robert Hilburn, great rock and roll critic, uh, called Paul Simon, The Life. I want to not just recommend that book, I want to tell you why I'm recommending it to you if you want to write great songs. Stick around and we'll talk about it. So I sometimes forget how important an influence Paul Simon was in my musical life. Uh, he's one of the earliest writers that I have a consciousness of, the earliest songwriters that I have a consciousness of. His new music was coming out. I had two older brothers. One of them brought home The Sounds of Silence in 1965 when it came out. Now, you know, I didn't really even have conscious memories at that time, but I can tell you this, that I loved that record. I know I loved it because the first LP I ever did buy was Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Thyme. Now, I had to be like five years old when it came out. I loved the record. I played it incessantly. So Simon and Garfunkel was just swirling around our house. And I could tell, even at the youngest age, that there was something really special about these songs that Paul Simon was writing. They were literary, they were poetic, but they always had a really personal side to them. And he was really bearing his soul. You know, now that I can look back on it and say that's what he was doing. You know, he was being so honest. He wasn't afraid to let his blemishes show. The other thing he did, and this is super clear in a song like Kathy's song, which has a verse, the song I was writing's left undone. I don't know why I spend my time writing songs that I can't believe with words that tear and strain to rhyme. I remember hearing that even when I was young and saying, wow, like, He's writing about himself. He's writing about the songwriting process. And I started to say, I can do that. I could write songs. So by the time I was in sixth grade, you know, we're talking 10 years old, I was already writing songs. And they, you know, a lot of them were no good, but that doesn't change the fact because one of the things I'm discovering by reading about Paul Simon is that he wrote lots of mediocre, derivative, copycat music early in his career and most of it never went anywhere. So it's helping me as I read this to sort of remind myself that even the superhuman songwriters like Paul Simon are in fact just human. And, and he was someone who worked very hard at his craft. And it wasn't until he went to college, went to, went to Queens College and had some literary classes that all of a sudden he started to realize he could write about himself. He could write about topics besides, you know, love songs and he could go deep, in other words. If you're up for it, I want to share a really mystical thing that happened to me. It was one of the, the earliest times in my life that I can remember having a really cosmic coincidence occur. And I know this is another reason why Paul Simon has figured so prominently in, in the way I have sort of built my own life as a songwriter. 1974, both my parents are from New York City. 1974, we go to New York from our home in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And on the flight to New York, to LaGuardia, Art Garfunkel is on the plane. He's up in first class. I have to walk right past him, right past his seat as I go back to my seat. And I see him, I sort of nod, you know, hello, and he, he acknowledges me. Didn't say a word, but went back to my seat and I was just stunned. I'm, I'm on a plane with Art Garfunkel. <laughs> this is amazing to me, right? I'm thinking that's who he is. And then we get off the plane, we go to the baggage claim. I'm standing right next to him. I kind of wanted to get as close as I could. And here coming down from the, the baggage uh, escalator, he grabs a duffel bag and I can see right on it a little tag that says A. Garfunkel. So I'm like, wow. Now I, I went and I, I typed Art Garfunkel duffel 
into Google and this image came up and I'll be darned if it isn't the same <laughs> duffel bag he had at that time. So there you go, Art Garfunkel and his duffel bag. The cosmic part comes in because on the very same trip to New York, one night we go to the Stanhope to hear Bobby Short. And I get up at some point to go to the bathroom and as I'm walking to the bathroom across the lobby, here walking toward me is Paul Simon. And I immediately recognize him and I, I get a really good look at him as he's coming toward me. He's not really paying attention. At a certain point though, he realizes I'm looking at him and he makes eye contact and he kind of gives me a little nod. He can tell I recognize him and I can tell he's not in any mood to get into a conversation. He changes his, his line of vision and he walks out the door. But there I had my little encounter with Paul Simon. Same trip, Art Garfunkel and Paul Simon completely random encounters or seemingly random encounters, but that's pretty cosmic. I got back to the table. I told my parents about it. And my dad said, it probably wasn't really Paul Simon because I mean, why would he be in a hotel anyway? You know, he, he lives here in New York city. Why would he be at the Stanhope? Well, reading Robert Hil Hilburn's book, any doubt that I might have had that that really was Paul Simon was completely dispelled as I was reading along and discovered that when he split from his wife Peggy in 1974, he went and stayed at the Stanhope. There you have it. <laughs> so all these years later, I discover, yes, in fact, it really was Paul Simon. There's absolutely no doubt about it. He was staying at the Stanhope. Uh, it cracks me up. The thing that I love about that story, aside from the fact that it is just the odds of it are just insane, it reinforced for me. I remember at the time saying, there's got to be a reason why I would run into both of these guys on this trip. Now, this is after they weren't Simon and Garfunkel anymore, right? And I think it was that it made me feel a magical connection to both of them, but particularly to Paul Simon because of the songwriting. And I was already trying to write songs at that time. And I remember feeling like when I got home, it, it renewed my interest. I wanted to look at his lyrics more carefully. And I really tried to emulate the poetry, but also the vulnerability of the way Paul writes. And that's sort of the message I want to share with you is if you want to improve your songwriting, A, read biographies of the of your songwriting heroes because it will really help you to realize that they're just human, but it will also help you understand the journey they went on to become the songwriters that you admire so much. The second thing is, I really do urge you to study the lyrics of Paul Simon. I mean, study him musically too, but, but his lyrics are masterful so much of the time and they evolve over time. When you look back at the early Simon and Garfunkel stuff, it's pretty overtly poetic in a lot of cases. Sound of Silence being a great example. Um, I actually wrote a paper about that in eighth grade. You know, that's how much it meant to me as a poem, as lyrics. But then as you watch him evolve through his early solo stuff, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard, Mother and Child Reunion, which if you don't know it, the song title was inspired by a dish on a Chinese menu, right? It's chicken and egg, you know, mother and child reunion. Through There Goes Rhyme and Simon with, with the whole Muscle Shoals vibe and songs like Kodachrome that have a really wry humor to them. And then onward through uh, Still Crazy After All These Years, One Trick Pony, which was a big flop, you know, and even the greats have their flops, right? Graceland, 1986, the how Graceland came about, kind of a fluke, but he was following his own muse. And that's a huge part of this. Now, if you study lyrics on Graceland, you discover that he is able to bounce back and forth between very personal, specific uh, references and things which immediately feel universal. Often they're a little bit abstract. They're not super literal. And that's part of what makes them just such wonderful lyrics. You're free to interpret them as a listener. He's not clubbing you over your, the head with a specific meaning. And, you know, you, you got to It's not like, let's say, Brian Adams, who tends to write in cliches and big grandiose concepts that are so common, you know, cuts like a knife. <laughs> Paul Simon is always challenging himself. 
he went through some really dark times. He has to labor. You find out that he has to labor over his songs, like for hours and hours, sometimes days, months, in trying to, to get what he knows that song is capable of being. I find that really reassuring. This isn't a guy who sat down and just instantly was writing classics, right? He worked at it and he, he made it work. And I think that's inspirational to me. I hope it's inspirational to you. So you're probably wondering why I'm talking about Paul Simon with a banjo in my lap. <laughs> I don't know if there's ever been a banjo on a Paul Simon record, even though he's had some pretty interesting instruments. I got this banjo recently. This came from Galloway Originals Reverb Store. I got this, it's an old K from the 40s or 50s. And uh, I was just messing around. I'm not a banjo player, but I love to have interesting, odd instruments to use when I'm recording. And so I thought, hey, having a banjo would be awesome, right? Um, so here's this instrument. I'm messing around, not as a banjo player, just... And I thought, oh, that's... I hear the drizzle of the rain Like a memory falls And I thought, wow, Kathy's song on a banjo. Who would have thought? But it sounds kind of nice. So I whipped together a few tracks just for this occasion. Thought I'd share with you what I guess we could call Country Kathy's song. While you're listening to this, focus in on the lyrics. Listen to how he builds this song from a series, a collage of images, experiences, vulnerabilities, places where he's weak and struggling. Uh, it's part of what makes it such a great song. I hear the drizzle of the rain Like a memory it falls Soft and warm continuing Tapping on my roof and walls From the shelter of my mind Distracted and diffused With thoughts are many miles away They lie with you when you are asleep They kiss you when you start your day Now the song I was writing Drops of rain weave their weary paths and die. I know that I am like the rain, there but for the grace of you.
So there you go. I hope that gives you a little bit of songwriting inspiration. You know, the fact is, I think there are many, many people who are capable of being great songwriters, and I believe you're one of them. If you follow through things like this, find out about you know, how others write great songs, what they went through, what their life experience was like. And if you then study what they're doing and apply their standards to the songs you're writing, I think you'll find that your writing improves almost instantly. Thank you so much for coming by. Please go to guitardiscoveries.com where you'll find all of my videos, uh, mystical and not mystical. And uh, hey, check out my Zazzle store, you know, this interesting old K guitar. I'm actually going to put up a K logo shirt. I've now got logo shirts up there, t-shirts we're talking about uh, for Tysco, for the Heritage, for um, Harmony, for Stella's, for, you know, things where you just can't find that stuff anywhere else. So I've been designing some things just for fun and throwing them up there. Uh, so check that out if you're interested. And uh, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell want you to get notified when new videos come out. So appreciate having you around. It's so fun for me and I hope it's inspirational for you and uh, helps you write better songs. We are gonna come back to the topic of songwriting. So keep coming back to, to check out the additional tools, tips, and tricks that I'll be sharing. Thanks so much, see you soon.